What's it like to end an empire? It's an unheard of thing in this modern era to end a nation in a day, outside of the doomsday scenarios of the Cold War as thought up by Herman Kahn. Nations persist, even in the case of radical reformation, which is the case with the ouster of dictators and the establishment of new constitutions in the Middle East during the Arab Spring. That wasn't always the case, though, throughout history. Previous eras could see an empire fragment on the death of a ruler, the key example being Alexander's Macedonian Empire, which was torn apart by the Diadoshi after the young conqueror's early death at 32. These transformative moments aren't common, but they aren't rare either. Empires could have their fates decided on a battlefield, and victory could mean ouster and a new overlord at the head of a transformed nation. And this transformation is important. It's one of the biggest drivers of ideas on a civilizational sense. Even if the mightiest conqueror in the world dies, the rest of the world persists. What happens to the nations that have their rulers ended on the battlefield? How do they transform? Does the victor simply overwrite the defeated? That's certainly been attempted ever since the ancient era. Does the conqueror adopt the practices of the conquered? The Achaemenid Persians were famous for maintaining traditional practices of their conquered territories. Even their great king of kings would dress like a pharaoh and lead Egyptian religious rites, just as the pharaohs that they had conquered had done. Or is there a third way, a combination of the two, an adaptation of nations to the changing times and a dialectical pattern established by Kant, Hegel, and Fichte. These questions will be answered by the mighty Kublai Khan as he faced the navy of the Song dynasty at the conclusion of a generations-long war. This is the Mongol conquest of China, which ends at the naval battle of Mount Ya. Now the conquest of China is a bit of a misnomer, because China was not a singular entity at the time of Genghis Khan. Throughout its history, China's experienced devastating civil wars and multi-kingdom conflict. And in the time of the Mongol rise, northern China was in control of the Jurchen Jin dynasty, conquering territory from the Song dynasty, who remained in power in the south of China. The Jurchen were a Tunguskic people from around the area of eastern Siberia and northeast Asia who migrated into the Manchuria region, conquered from the lands of the Song dynasty, and they ruled as the Jin. This would mean plenty of divisions for the Mongols to exploit. Neither the southern Song nor the northern Jin could bring to bear as many resources against this newly ascendant Mongol army as the singular united Song of ages past. After the unification of the Mongol tribes into a single force by the mighty Genghis Khan, the newly formed Mongol Empire looked to expand in all directions, including to the regions that compose today's China. Now, Genghis Khan desired the destruction of the Jin dynasty due to two major factors. The first was an eminently practical concern. The Jurchen Jin were rich and had quite fertile territory, both quite desirable for a new power looking to establish itself. There was also a matter of honor. The Jurchen regularly established tribute raids against the Mongols and had used the Tatars to hobble them, even capturing one of their previous unifiers, Ambagai Khan, and executing him. Thus, Genghis ordered an attack on the Jin dynasty, and the Mongols achieved some battlefield successes but the fortifications of the Jin were a significant strategic hurdle for Genghis's army to overcome. The Mongols lacked the ability to carry out siegecraft, as they were primarily a nomadic people, and so had no need to develop a military tradition of siege warfare. This left a problem for Genghis to solve, and so he appointed several of his senior staff to devise a solution. Their solution was exceptionally simple, yet so brilliant that it's no surprise that the Mongols became such a mighty force in such a short period of time. One of the key strengths of the Mongols was their ability to incorporate specialists into their army. 
As mentioned, the Northern Jin were a dynasty of foreign conquerors from Central Asia. This did not make a lot of the ethnic Han Chinese happy, and so plenty of them defected to join the Mongols, and the Mongols were happy to take them. They had so many defectees that the Mongols were even able to establish an army that they entitled the Han Army. More than that, though, they loved Chinese specialists, with doctors and scholars being very prized. The key acquisition for the military, though, was not the doctors, but the siege engineers and other masters of war machines. The Chinese were the first to create the torsion trebuchet, which were much stronger and had much greater range than the simple catapults. These trebuchet would help Genghis crack the nut that were Jin fortifications. Another weapon shows the advances of these new technologies even in the early 13th century. An incredibly crude form of grenade that could be thrown by hand, with a larger projectile capable of being launched via siege engines. These larger ones could be heard up to 50 kilometers away. The hand grenade even had a variable length fuse, showcasing the blending of the chemical and the military sciences together. These were the Gentianle, the thunder crash bomb, made from a cast iron shell stuffed with Chinese gunpowder, the first power in the world to create this weapon. Now it's worth noting the physical limitation and evolution of Chinese gunpowder from its discovery to the time of the Mongol invasion. The gunpowder of early China was very weak compared to the chemically refined and purified mixtures that we make today. The Chinese did not have the reserves of saltpeter, that's the mineral form of potassium nitrite, that later empires in the early modern era would. By physics standards, early gunpowder isn't even powerful enough to be considered an explosive. But by the 12th century, both the Jin and the Song were creating these thundercrash bombs that could act as grenades. Even in this early form, the sound and the shock was devastating to morale and the iron shards were effective anti-personnel weapons. Not only did Genghis Khan find his solution in defecting Chinese engineers, but these were engineers who specifically had built these walls. They knew the fortifications that he was attempting to tear down. The war between the Jurchen Jin and the Mongols under Genghis Khan came when an envoy demanded the submission of the Mongols as overlord of all the steppe people, to which... Genghis spat on the earth and rode, showing his back, a calculated insult to the envoy, along with calling the Jin emperor a coward. Genghis would launch his campaign in 1211. The Jin campaigned ineffectively. At the Battle of Yehuling, with the Mongols on mountainous terrain which impeded their cavalry, the Jin sent an ambassador to start negotiations instead of attacking immediately. Genghis persuaded the emissary, who was descended from a nomadic tribe located in Northeast Asia, to defect and give up the location of the Jin army. He attacked the Jin at Huan Erzui and pushed forward. While the mountains were bad for the Mongol horsemen, the difficult terrain prevented messages and coordination between the numerically superior Jin army, and Genghis was able to destroy them piece by piece before the enemy broke. He took the capital in 1213 and was able to force a surrender by 1215, though pacification efforts would continue for several years afterwards. The Mongols also pillaged the plains of northern China for spoils. The Jurchen Jin, upon receiving peace, attacked the Song dynasty in a war of plunder to recoup their losses. This invasion was a disaster, and the Jin were left as easy pickings for the Mongols when they renewed under Genghis's son Ogadai and a counter-invasion from the Song Dynasty, with the Jin ending in 1234. The Song Dynasty in southern China was a much tougher nut to crack than the Jurchen Jin. The Song was one of the most powerful Chinese dynasties in history, and they brought forth a lot of advances in the hard and soft sciences. They were the first nation in the world to use paper money needed because the sheer amount of trade being done meant that there was not enough coinage to accurately represent the amount of currency 
within the kingdom. Furthermore, the Song would not weaken their armies through poor deployment or ill-advised campaigns against their neighbors. They responded in a methodical fashion, learning the lessons from the defeat of the Jin. The Mongols were also not at full strength. They had been sending troops toward Europe and the Middle East to conquer in those directions. The Mongols and the Song traded locations and fortifications back and forth, with the governor of Sichuan using key fortifications in mountain regions as redoubts to blunt Mongol attacks and use his staging areas for his own troops. The Chinese were also able to use their gunpowder weapons effectively. Using pots filled with gunpowder, with holes which sent out large licks of fire. Like normal fire, that could curl around obstacles, and the Mongol defenses of covered trenches to protect against missile fire was ineffective. The fire simply flowed over the fieldwork and burnt the unfortunate Mongol soldier underneath, using it as cover. The Mongols were able to conquer and hold the mighty city of Chengdu, but they weren't able to secure a decisive victory over the central Song holdings. Without more support from the great Khan, the Mongol forces wouldn't be able to muster the war machine necessary to take on the mighty Song dynasty. The support they needed came from the election of Monke Khan, grandson of the great Genghis, to the position of Khagan, the Khan of Hans, in 1251. Monke was an expansionist and empire builder who cracked down on administrative corruption and desired to get his army back to the job of imperial conquest. One of his targets was the Song dynasty. They had, after all, imprisoned a Mongol envoy and his entourage, and the envoy had died in prison. That was something that irritated the Mongols to no end, even though at times they did the exact same thing. Most nations that ended up harming a Mongol envoy was probably going to be invaded anyway. It did not hurt to get that violation of diplomatic immunity as an excuse to wage war. Monke Khan, however, did not live long past the start of his invasion. He was off to a great start. By 1258, he was attacking Sichuan and looked poised to occupy it. But during the siege of Diayu Fortress the next year, the Khan became violently ill with some form of waterborne illness, either cholera or dysentery or something, as well as complications due to gout. The fortress itself would resist fall campaigns from the Mongols for 20 years. Much like what happened in Eastern Europe with the death of Ogedai Khan, the campaigns stalled out until the election of the new Khagan, but this did not mean nothing happened. In the wake of Monke's death, Kublai Khan, another grandson of Genghis, handled the turnover of Sichuan under Mongol suzerainty and became the new Khagan, but had to engage in a fierce civil war, called the Toliev War because it was between two members of the Toloi family, for the position of Khan of Khan. This war lasted four years and devastated the Mongol capital of Karakorum, further fracturing the Mongol Empire. Faced with this, in 1271, Kublai Khan founded the Yuan dynasty, one of the four successor Khanates to the great Mongol Empire, and enjoyed only token authority over the western Khanate. The Song might have used these divisions to launch attacks of their own, but they also faced significant problems. Peasant rebellions had cropped up in Fujian, that's the area of mainland China opposite the island of Taiwan. The Song court itself was nearly bankrupt. Emperor Duzong concerned himself only with demanding fresh women all day and drinking all night, and the court was dominated by factional struggles that prevented Song China from mustering the resources enough to handle the Mongol incursions. While Monke was cutting down corruption, Emperor Duzong was passing laws that said that any woman he ever had relations with had to see him every morning, sometimes having 30 female visitors every day. The Mongol incursions were relentless, and these were assisted by new inventions coming from far afield. Whereas Chinese gunpowder weapons were going west, spread by the Mongols, there were new inventions coming back east, through the Middle East, also being brought by the Mongols. 
the chinese developed the first trebuchet the traction or torsion trebuchet due to the power being in the torsion of the repeated winding to give the siege ending its kicking power these new weapons were an improvement in every conceivable sense of the word this new counterweight trebuchet these trebuchets had greater range and thanks to the counterweight system they were far more accurate and precise in the amount of force that they could bear in mongol records these were called the frankish mangonels and in chinese history these were called the muslim trebuchets both of these terms are accurate siege engineers from persia and modern-day iraq had worked on mongol siege crews to design and utilize these weapons and german and french crusaders had brought over siege engines to support the crusader states in the early thirteenth century no matter what you call them though these siege engines were dramatically effective cities that were capable of resisting mongol siege engineers in the past had their walls reduced to rubble thanks to this new engine they could fire projectiles up to three hundred kilograms in weight about one half of a kilometer in range the strength of these weapons was so intimidating that emperor duzong upon hearing of their awesome power gave up the key city of Xiangyang, which had successfully resisted Mongol siege for six years, as lost, and it fell within a few weeks. Emperor Duzong did not long outlive the city, and the Song dynasty passed into the hands of the four-year-old Emperor Gong. The Song fortresses fell, one by one, as did the claimants to the Song throne. Emperor Gong himself was lucky. He was surrendered by his mother and his regents and lived fifty years past the story being told as a guest of the Yuan dynasty. Without its key cities and fortresses, the Song loyalists established themselves as a moving court, primarily on the water. They would move from city to city, confiscating boats and other properties to sustain their court in exile. Unable to contend with this directly, Kublai Khan ordered his general Bayan to build a great riverine navy using the designs for Chinese warships, a project which took years but was vital to the success of their campaign. The smaller Yuan boats were little more than matchwood against the experienced sailors of the Song Riverine Navy. Despite this commanding advantage on the water, the Song were hard-pressed. Direct attacks against the Yuan forces were suicidal, and the new emperors were barely older than their younger brother, inspiring little loyalty. Emperor Duanzong was nine when he died of illness after nearly drowning, and the final Song claimant was Emperor Bing, a scant seven years old. Worse still, the confiscation to fund the Song war effort had sent plenty of people into the Yuan's waiting arms. Thus, the last emperor was shepherded by the last of the Song, the three great heroes. When Tianzang the infantry commander, and even held today as a popular Chinese symbol of enduring patriotism, Prime Minister Liu Jiufu, who helped the two young emperors escape, and helped Empress Dowager Yang run the Song court in exile, and Zhang Shiji, a former criminal from Jin who became the admiral of the Song navy. Wen was able to hold out for two years stymieing the Yuan march using mountain insurgency tactics until he was captured at Haifang his infantry scattered, and rendering the Song a purely naval force, numbering about 1,000 ships in total, mostly transport vessels containing around 200,000 people in all. Without a land force, Zhang Shiji ordered his troops to Yamen in Guangdong to prepare the defenses there. To prevent any of his troops from fleeing, he ransacked the mouth of the bay, capturing all of the supplies he could and ordering the burning of every structure that could offer refuge and eliminating any means of retreat further west. The Song would live and die on the water at Yamen. In response, the new Yuan Navy under Admiral Zhang Hongfang, rumored to be a kinsman of Zhang Shiji, amassed his 50 warships and 20,000 soldiers to meet the Song defenses and bring the conquest of southern China to its conclusion. Hongfang had his work cut out for him. Most of the Song were non-combatants who had lived the life of a courtier rather than a soldier or sailor. But when faced with annihilation, people will fight. That's why Sun Tzu advised that an army not be surrounded entirely but be left away open. This is hardly unique to Sun Tzu, 
You can even see it in the Strategon for the Byzantine military. When faced with annihilation, people will fight. And it's likely that the fighting strength of the Song Dynasty to include non-combatant volunteers would outnumber the 20,000 soldiers under Yuan command. Furthermore, Hong Fang was ordered by the Yuan court not to use catapults as an inner ship weapon, as it increased the chances that Song would flee and continue this chase, which the treasury was not equipped to continue much longer. The ceaseless war against the Song had exhausted even the economic powerhouse that the Mongols had conquered, and even centuries after the Song, the economy would never be the same under the Yuan. Worse, the large Song fleet could perhaps move and overwhelm coastal towns, flipping hard won Yuan territory and sustaining their campaign. Thus, the orders were to starve out the Song navy by denying them bases and access to food and fresh water by keeping them fixed at Yaman. An easy choice for the courtiers at the strategic level, but constraining the admiral's hand significantly. In order to achieve victory for Kublai Khan against the Song flotilla, Hong Fang would need to get creative. Noticing that the Song ships were lashed together, perhaps in a further attempt to keep ships from fleeing, Hong Fang decided that the ships were too constrained to maneuver effectively. His first idea was to send fire ships to attack. As tight as they were, only a few tacks would need to be effective to start a raging inferno that would be hard to stop. The fire ship is just as simple as it sounds. It's a ship rigged to either combust or explode and steered towards an enemy ship. The tactic itself is from the 4th century BC, and in a way it still finds use in the modern era with the use of explosive-packed speedboats used by insurgency and suicide attacks. Zhang Siji was not so easily fooled, however. He had specifically ordered his ships to be painted with fire-resistant mud, a preparation he had made during the long voyage at sea moving the young Emperor Bing. His early plan thwarted, Hong Fen ordered an attack with about a quarter of his forces. But the Song forces were able to beat them back handily, using ranged weapons effectively. Much to Hong Fen's chagrin, his cannons, much like his catapults, were deemed to be too risky, as it would break the formation up and allow smaller packs of ships to overwhelm his smaller fleet and perhaps secure Emperor Bing's escape. This hamstrung him even further and forced him to rely upon arrow fire. To that end, Hong Fang ordered archery platforms to give his archers an elevated position so they could fire down upon the decks of the Song ships. But that required him to get within archery range first, and the number of Song ships prevented that attack from getting anywhere close. Thus, he came upon a new idea and recalled his ships. And then, music began to play. To the Song aboard their ships, this must have been incredibly confusing. Picture it. Someone conscripted into the battle of their life, someone who was a clerk, forced to man the decks to defend the emperor against these rampaging foreign invaders. There's no retreat, and day by day, supplies are getting a little lower. Nausea abounds among the crew, water's in short supply, and then the Yuan troops start singing, playing festive music, and preparing for a great banquet. This might sound strange, but it's actually a Chinese stratagem called the Empty Fort Technique. Once, during the Three Kingdoms era, the great strategist Zhuge Liang, though there are actually previous examples of it, when being pursued, he ordered that the fort's gates be opened, and he sat calmly in the middle, playing a zither. And this so confused the general Sima Yi, because Zhuge Liang had the reputation of a fearsome strategist, that he ordered no attack be made, thus tricking Shima Yi into thinking that he had an actual card to play, when in fact he was doomed. Then a small screen of ships advanced, barely manned. This was odd. There was no general attack ordered by the Yuan flagship. These ships appeared to be attacking against orders, Perhaps they were looking to surprise the Song ships, or perhaps they were unmoored and sailing due to the vagaries of the wind and pre-modern nautical engineering. Just as an aside, naval combat was chancy even well into the 19th and 20th centuries when compared to ground combat. So, this development could be nothing short of divine providence for the flagging Song. There are barely any troops aboard these ships. A quick seizure 
could get vital supplies and restore flagging morale. But when the boarding ships got close, the war horn sounded, and soldiers burst out of hiding under banquet cloths. Now within arrow range, the Yuan archers were much more effective against the Song troops. The non-combatants were capable of using ranged weapons, but in marine-to-marine -marine combat, they were no match for the disciplined Yuan armies. The Yuan were able to cut a few lines and sink a few ships, and the Song, moored together, could not move to mutually aid one another. The great line that had meant to keep ships together meant that they couldn't maneuver, just as Hong Fang had predicted. To keep the Song troops confused, Hong Fan then aborted his attack and struck from another direction under his sub-commander Li Heng, creating mass chaos and confusion before he ordered a general charge towards the flagship intent on capturing Emperor Bing. Hong Fang was dramatically effective specifically because he was so confusing. With the morale of the Song forces fraying, his unorthodox attack shattered rational thinking and left them muddled and unable to respond. This is even true today. It's called breaking the OODA loop, where you specifically get inside someone's head and prevent them from making rational conclusions. The lack of supplies meant that the ships were not capable of fighting in fierce melee combat, and that broke them. The Song flagship had shields to protect their decks from arrow fire, but they could not resist the boarding action. Seeing that all was lost, Liu Zhufu took the seven-year-old Emperor Bing into his arms, embraced him, and jumped into the bay, along with tens of thousands of Song courtiers, male and female, noble and peasant. Zhang Siji caught about a dozen ships and evaded the Yuan navy sent to pursue him, and then completely disappeared from the pages of history. One day, 19 March in 1279, where an empire existed at sunrise, and didn't at sunset. Hong Fen knew that he had to end an empire. His superior at the Yuan court ordered it to be so, even making sure he couldn't bring the full power of his warships to bear just so it would be more likely that the empire would be ended. But the full gravity of that could not have been known until tens of thousands of Song people decided to jump into the water rather than surrender, washing ashore for the next seven days. Yet while the Song died, the Yuan dynasty established themselves as the new ruling dynasty of China and would rule until the rise of the Ming dynasty 100 years later. The Yuan government, much like their military, incorporated practices from the people they conquered. Much like the Song, the Yuan divided their government into the civil, military, and censorial departments, though sticking with their Mongol roots, the Privy Council, which had managed military affairs, retained much de facto power. So in some ways, the Song dynasty survived in the Yuan dynasty, which would pass down their traditions to the Ming, and further down the lines of history. So too did the Song survive in the nearby kingdom of Dai Viet, modern-day Vietnam, who supported the native Tron dynasty in repulsing the Yuan when they came to invade. In the old days of monarchy, it was a common enough saying on the death of the king to say, The king is dead! Long live the king! as a way of announcing the important event and securing stability with the ascension of the new monarch. In this way, empires too follow the same pattern. The Song are dead, long live the Yuan. The Yuan are dead, long live the Ming. The ideas are dead, but they live. The people die, but they live. The empire is dead. Long live the empire. Thanks for listening.